All right. Morning, everyone. Morning. So, uh, yeah, this talk is called Your pa Sales Page Sucks. So I'm Nick Adams, uh, I'm the CEO of WP Buffs, we're a WordPress maintenance and support company uh, based all around the world 24-7. Um, our team is on every continent except for Antarctica, so if anyone knows a good lead on someone I can get in Antarctica, a penguin, a scientist, anything is fine. Um, now, so I lived here in Rochester for eight years. Um, I now live in Saco Bay, Maine, which is just north of Boston, just south of Portland, Maine, and there are more sharks than I am comfortable with. I kid you not, just last week a fisherman was like fishing and pulled a whole like great white shark like it accidentally came onto the beach and he had to drag it back into the water and the thing was like way more, like it was longer than I am, it's very concerning. But anyways, uh, yeah, Maine is wonderful, Boston is wonderful, but Rochester is wonderful, which um, leads me to my next and most important point of the next point of the slide, go Bills! So, <laughs> what's about to happen? Um, first, we're going to talk about some common mistakes that people make with sales pages. Um, you may see yourself in this presentation metaphorically. I promise I'm not using examples of any real people, um, but there is a chance you may look at that and think like, shoot, that one's me. Um, and any uh, likenesses are unintentional, um, except for pictures of Matt Graham, which, you know, that's just stock images. Um, and then we're going to go over best practices and then um, some parting advice. So let's get started. Uh, we have a couple people coming in late, so I just want to make sure they get the most important point. Go Bills. Go Bills. Woo! Yeah. You don't have to pay attention to the rest, that's fine. Um, so the m common mistake number one is not having a sales page. Um, this sounds like, well, duh, but you'd be amazed the number of uh, businesses that I've worked with where, like, they don't actually have sales pages. Like, they expect people to, like, go to their website, read some stuff, and then want to contact them and buy whatever it is they're selling, whether it's a service, a product, or anything like that, but they don't actually have dedicated sales pages. And so, honestly, the biggest mistake you can do is thinking that your website is not selling something. It may not be something that you think of like, oh, I'm selling this product or I'm selling this service. But, you know, if your website is just a profile of yourself, what you're selling is yourself. Um, and so, yeah, we all should be thinking of our websites as having at least some kind of sales page. Um, if, you know, if you have a website for pretty much any reason, it's to get some kind of buy-in. Just a couple thoughts on that. Um, it is your most important page. Um, honestly, especially if you're doing any type of business stuff, um, people don't care about pretty much anything else you put on your site. Um, like they don't care about your story. They don't, uh, they don't care where you're from. Um, if they don't even know what you're selling. Um, and so that's why, um, if you have a business website, um, whether it's one person business, or a 50 person business, um, you know, people are most likely looking for one thing. It's to find out what you're selling. Um, you also only have about 60 seconds to hook them. Um, so a general marketing principle is you have less than 60 seconds generally to get people to actually be hooked on your site or they're more, they're quite likely to go. Um, so you've probably heard about bounce rate and that's, that is like the eternal struggle for marketers because so often people go to a website, they either can't find what they're looking for or what they do find is pretty boring. Um, and so they're like, nope, I'm done. I'm moving on. Time to go to TikTok. Um, so you want to think about that all the time. Like, what am I conveying to people in 60 seconds? And you want to pin it to the front. Um, that's one of the other mistakes. Uh, so this is all a sub mistake, which is they might have sales pages, but they're like impossible to find. They're buried like nine layers deep. They're not in the menu. They're not on the header. I recommend take your most important thing you want someone to do, whether it's sign up for something, contact you, whatever the goal of your website is, put it like front and center. Like make it be like the main content. Um, you can put everything else after it, um, but even better, put it in the header. Like make a special section, make it stand out and just have it be like, this is why you're on this website. Um, give them the chance to ignore everything else, but still fulfill the whole reason you have a website. 
Mistake number two, not having a way to contact you. Um, so even if your goal is to get people to check out right on the website, so you're thinking like, well, I don't need them to be able to contact me, I just want them to buy whatever I'm selling. Um, what happens if checkout doesn't work? Um, let's be honest, like all checkout systems, even Shopify, um, you know, occasionally has an outage. Um, and you know, WooCommerce might, for some reason, have an issue with Stripe where all of a sudden the checkout won't go through. If they don't have a way to contact you, then you're probably just going to lose the sale of whatever it is. Um, but also, like, not everyone feels comfortable like buying without talking to someone. And so you should always make sure you have a way for people to contact you. My recommendation when you're doing that, collect their email. If you get nothing else, at least get their email address. Don't even worry about the name before getting them to fill something out. And then use like an abandoned cart plugin um, that will like save, like if they start filling out like the checkout or anything like that, like even better if you have like an opt-in so that you can just like market to them to their in email inbox. Um, I know we all hate spam emails, but like if somebody goes to your website and puts in their email address, it means they're actually probably going to read your emails too. Um, you know, that'd be kind of weird to like sign up for an email list that you really don't want to be on. Um, not saying people don't do it, but uh, yeah, like you can get their name later, but as long as you have their email address, you can contact them. Uh, I've seen a lot where like people say like that they want like somebody's phone number, they want somebody's name, um, and that's all great, but I recommend if you have like a form, make it a multi-step form, make the very first uh, thing their email address because with that it unlocks so much stuff because it's not actually just you can email them, you can find them on the internet with just their email because yeah, you Google somebody's email address and you get all sorts of information about um, anything else where they've posted that. And don't make them search. Um, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to contact you so that you don't lose the lead. Um, I recommend doing like a thing in the corner where like a little contact button that can even like pop up and just say like, hey, if you want to send a message, um, just something so that way like if somebody goes to your website, they can't figure out what you sell, they can't, um, they can't get checkout to work, make it easy for them to just click it and say like, hey, I want to sign up, I, I want to buy your product, but it's not working. Give them that chance to reach out so that you can then talk to them. Um, most people will understand that software has glitches and so they are more, they're very likely to be able to sign up even if they couldn't sign up right away because of issues, as long as they can reach you. Um, because they're going to feel comfortable with you because they know that they can reach you, they know that you're a real person and, uh, and they know that you make it easy for them because they're going to feel better when they go to reach you and it's just right there. Um, mistake number three, not having a call to action, CTA. So I'm going to refer to CTA several times now throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, funny thing, I'm not a marketer, um, but that's one of those ones like I at first like was hearing CTA all the time and now like um, I, you know, I dream about like CTAs um, because the call to action is like the most important thing you can have because ultimately on your website you want people taking some kind of action. Um, and so your goal should always be for their leads to do something. Um, even if that is just put in their email address, um, but that's not just because that's the transaction that gets you their information, but also because um, there's like a psychological principle within marketing. I don't remember what it's called, but it, it has to do with buy-in. Um, and, uh, oh, it's the sunk cost belief or the sunk cost fallacy, which is people are way more likely to sign up if they feel like they've already started the process. So by getting them to do something, getting them to fill out a form, getting them to do something, even better if you can get them to buy something, like if, if you're sure that they'll be happy with whatever service or something you're selling, get them to check out right away because they're a lot more likely to follow through on it um, if they feel like, well, I'm, I'm already invested in this. Even if it's just five minutes of their time, that's enough to hook somebody um, if you get them to sign up and then you send them an email and they read your email, they're a lot more likely to want to engage with you for the long term. So you really should always be thinking about call to actions. Um, that can be a button. Um, so it's basically you're literally just saying to them, this is the action I want you to take. Um, any action is fine. Um, not everyone agrees on that, but this is um, my philosophy and I'm 100% correct because go Bills. Um, 
And so um, you want to do anything. Get them to join a mailing list. Get them to check out. Get them to jump into a chat. Like even if it's literally like a chat bot, um, it's still best to at least have the option to like, like just click it, have a conversation. Um, and you want to make it early. Again, like I said earlier, you only have about 60 seconds with the average visitor uh, before they're gone. So you don't want to wait to give them an opportunity to act. You don't want to make them scroll through an entire page to have like the call to action at the bottom. You should have it so that like in those first like 10 seconds, there's something for them to do. Because uh, they're then more likely to stay for longer than 60 seconds. If they click on it, um, you know, if it gets them doing something, if it's a chat, if it's um, you know, getting started in the contact or checkout process, um, that's going to be super important. And then mistake number four, having way too much content. Um, that is one of the, probably the biggest issue that a lot of people have is um, they load up their website. They're like, well, I want to give people all the information they want to know about my business. So I'm going to tell them about my, my very first dog that I had when I was a child. It has nothing to do with the business, but people think like, well, I'll just tell them everything about me. It'll make them like me. And then, um, you know, then they'll want to work with me. Instead, what it really does is it means that the person is going to get like, you know, one third way through the first like, like 500 word paragraph and just say, ah, forget it. I can just buy this from someone else. So you really want to just make the sale. Um, you, you really don't want to like get them invested. You can tell them like, if you really want them to feel like connected to you, do that after. Like get them to take the action and then, you know, then send them stuff. Because at that point, like, you know, if you send them an email, it's like, well, let me tell you about my very first dog. Um, maybe they'll read it. Maybe they'll say, oh, that's really neat. Um, but at least that way, like you've already gotten them to do what you want your website to do. Um, and you want to get them from point C to point A. Um, and you're wondering why that? Because the call to action. Um, it's all about that CTA. Don't waste their time or yours. If you're spending like hundreds of hours coming up with all this crazy content for your website, but ultimately people are skipping it all because they're just trying to find how to sign up or how to buy whatever you're selling, um, you're wasting their time of searching and you're wasting yours. And mistake number five, sloppy content. Did anybody notice? Yeah, how like, yeah, how, how much did it affect the way you feel about my presentation? And how much did that one do it? Yes, these are intentional. Um, my mother is an English professor, so, um, so I know the importance of that. Um, but I kid you not, I've seen so many websites where like, there are so many issues and like just glaring mistakes. And these people are like selling services. Worse is like, I've seen it on companies selling like content services. So they're like, we'll write articles for you. Articles is spelled wrong. Awesome. Yes, I'm going to trust you on my website. Um, and that's true. Um, having sloppy content, not cleaning up your stuff. Um, I've seen ones where people, um, this one happens a lot. People take my company's website, they copy our content and put it on their own website trying to sell the same services. They forget to change the business name. So you go to this other business and it says, we here at WP Buffs. Like, um, I mean, thanks for the free advertising for us, I guess, because now people are going to be like, who is, um, you've had that happen? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but yeah, um, all sorts of sloppy content, though, um, can really kill you. Um, if you're sending out people stuff that has, like, spelling errors, um, they're more likely because, I mean, maybe it didn't actually affect how anyone felt about my presentation, but I'm guessing that somebody looked at this, um, saw the your and your, and probably was like, yeah, this, this guy's not great at editing his stuff. Um, and then maybe you saw that and you were like, oh, no, that's ironic. He's talking about poor grammar and s spelling and did that one wrong. Um, but really, the point of that was just that, like, you think about, you look at that, and then for, like, that second, you're just like, ooh, that's not great. Um, but that's also with um, stuff. I've seen ones where people start a sentence and then don't finish the sentence, and then that's like on their main sales page. So it's just like, you should sign up right now and you'll get a free and nothing. Um, so maybe that's a good way to get people to be like, oh, I want to contact them, find out what the thing is. Um, but 
My guess is that more people were probably like, I don't care because they couldn't even get that. Um, have an editor. An editor does not mean you hire an editing service necessarily. Um, if you can, highly recommend it because um, editors know what to look for um, and often they'll find things that are not just um, about what you've said but how you've said it and they can give you good feedback on that. So we can be an expert. We can also be a friend um, or just really anyone who's spelling, grammar, content, etc. Um, you want to get them in there to um, to just look at it because fresh eyes will spot the errors before you will. You can be great at that um, because like yeah like I've seen that with authors and everything else like they uh, they're great at writing they made a, gr a grammatical error by accident they had a typo but because they wrote the content they can't see that error you can show them just that sentence 12 times and they might miss it every time just because like you wrote it you know what it's supposed to say and the way our brains work is um, you may know this about just the science of how people read is we actually read the beginning and end of words and we just kind of skip the order of the letters in the middle so if you already know what the word is supposed to say um, you're most likely gonna miss that it's got an issue um, and it really does matter um, I wouldn't blame you if you thought to yourself does it really matter we all make mistakes and absolutely you're correct we do make mistakes but when you only have seconds to make an impression you want to show that what you do you do with precision and care you want people at that and feel like okay this is an expert this is somebody who's going to do a great job because if you're selling cheese that may seem like well what does spelling have to do with that but they may think like well if they don't care about precision with that how do I know that they made the cheese properly um, how do I know that they aren't just like skipping through everything um, so that's just something to think about it really I think it does matter and um, I think it's it's worth doing and mistake number six not enough content. They do need some info. Um, it would have been a good joke now that I think about it if I had no other slide after this that expounded on this. It's like, that's not enough content. Um, but unfortunately, I wasn't clever enough earlier. Um, so uh, you want to tell them what you're selling. Um, if your website doesn't explain what you're selling, what's the point of the website? Um, I've literally seen ones where people try to go full minimalist and they basically just have like titles but it doesn't actually explain what they're selling. Um, and sometimes that's like with WordPress plugins, they're one of the biggest culprits. Um, you go on it and you're like, cool, like you have all these like buzzwords, but like, what are you actually selling? I actually don't know what your plugin does. Um, but also you need content for SEO. Um, so that one's just super practical. If you try and go full minimalist, like people are not gonna be able to like find you on Google. And no matter how much you think you're, uh, you know, SEO doesn't matter. It probably matters at least a decent amount to the point that you're going to want to make sure that you have enough content to uh, make it so people can find you. So that was the end of the mistakes. Does anyone have any questions about the mistakes before I move on? Sweet. Um, yeah, so these are uh, best practices. Number one, set page goals. Um, the other point other than go bills um, that I want you to walk away from this presentation with is set page goals like even if you walk away from here and you're like I don't remember anything he said he was just busy um, making jokes about what was on his slide like that's fine but just remember to set page goals that's the like thing that so many people don't do um, is they think like like oh I'm just gonna make the content and it'll sell um, the reason you have a goal is because you need to know what the page is even for. Is it to inform people? Uh, like maybe there is no like checkout, but is it goal of a page to inform people? Is it to push them to a checkout page? Like maybe it's um, you know something that explains what you do. And be on that page, you want to be funneling people to the checkout page. Uh, is it to collect their email, and or is it to collect their money? Which is you know most checkout pages, most product pages is ultimately. You're just trying to collect the money. Um, and I think that's pretty legit because if it's a business website, you need money to, to operate. Um, so that's a very valid reason. Um, but you should always look at that for the page and just say, why do I, why do I have this page? Um, and how does this goal tie into other goals? So if you have multiple sales pages, which is pretty common, um, 
there's a sales funnel and a lot of times you start with like pretty basic stuff try and get them in and that's where you try to have your first call to action some kind of buy-in but then you may send them to another page to kind of get them down the funnel and the goal of the funnel is like you just try and get them closer and closer to the point that um, the end of the funnel is usually now they're a customer um, and so um, you need to think about like how do those work together because if every single page's goal is to inform then how are you ever gonna collect their info or collect their money um, and so you always want to look at that and make sure that like each works together because you also don't want to like have 10 pages where the goal is to collect their money because uh, if you're doing 10 different pages for checkout um, just because you think like well I should always have checkout you those are probably not gonna be great checkout pages because um, you're not gonna be able to focus on each one um, and when I talk about that um, that has to do with this tracking your goals so um, number two is once you know what your goals are track them um, traffic analytics so Google Analytics generally is what people use there are alternatives to Google Analytics um, and so if you aren't using some type of traffic analytics you should start even if you are literally just posting pictures of your favorite beanie babies from the 90s like you still probably want to know like how many people went to go see the one of the monkey which I think was named Bongo yeah, I think that was the best one I think we can all agree go Bills um, <laughs> don't just track page hits and if you're wondering what a monkey has to do with Bills absolutely nothing um, that was just my favorite beanie baby um, don't just track page hits um, that's another mistake that people do so I probably could put that in mistakes but really when you're doing goals don't just say like well I want to get a hundred people on this page because a hundred people on a page doesn't mean anything if all they do is go to the page um, you want to also be tracking events so like I mentioned before you want to have a call to action and you want to track that call to action uh, in Google Analytics especially in Google Analytics 4 there's all sorts of things that you can track events so you can track every time somebody clicks a certain button so that way you can see like which buttons did people click on um, and you want to have goals for that you don't just want to say like I want people to click the button you want to say I want 50% of people who go to this page to click the button um, because that's gonna also give you things to work on because if if only 4% of people do that and you're expecting that 50% of the people are gonna click the button then that means that something is probably wrong and you need to um, to look at your page just what can be fixed to get you to the goals and that is why we use smart goals so they need to be specific measurable achievable relevant and time-bound um, so like for specific yeah like um, we we want them to be specific we don't just want to say like I want sales because that's not really a good goal I mean technically that is like the goal but like in that like how are you gonna meeting that goal are you literally just gonna say like I made one sale this year so therefore it's great success um, most likely you're gonna want to do many sales so that you can uh, actually be making money and you want them to be measurable um, a lot of people make goals that are more um, qualitative which is somewhat you know somewhat still helpful you can't have qualitative goals but you really want to try to have quantitative goals and um, ones that you can measure so number of clicks number of checkouts um, it can also be things like um, amount of sales it can be um, even like cost per acquisition um, which is like how much did I spend for every customer who signed up um, so if you spent like a million dollars on marketing but you got a million customers to sign up like you're probably doing really well um, but if you spent a million dollars on marketing but you had one customer sign up then your cost of customer acquisition is probably unless you're selling a two million dollar product you're probably not doing great um, you want it to be achievable you don't want to say I want to sell a billion dollars like sure we'd all love to sell a billion dollars um, on our website but like you want it to be realistic partly because like if you're always just falling so far below the goal it's not really a goal it's just a a dream um, and and you're not likely to be able to improve on it because if you say well I want this crazy lofty goal um, but not one you could ever get to anyway then how are you gonna actually work towards that goal yeah you may make improvements but you want things that you can like measure and then achieve like you want to be able to hit however many of the uh, of the goals you have you want to do that um, and you want them to be relevant you don't want to like have a goal of like 
I want 50 people to send me recipes on my website that is selling car parts. Like, because um, I know that like that's an extreme example, but people make some pretty irrelevant goals. Um, some of them are like, I want people to share my blog posts more. That's one that I see a lot because people think, well, if more people read my blog posts, they're going to sign up for my products. Um, most people will tell you that actually doesn't happen. Um, if people are just sharing your content without it having like very good call to actions and they're not actually sharing your like product pages, odds are that like you're not really getting that, that return that you really want. And they want to be time bound. You don't want to just say like, I want to have a thousand customers someday. Um, you want to say like, I want to have a thousand customers by like a year and a half from now. Um, anything like that. And that's just so that like you can actually have goals, achieve them, and then reassess at certain intervals. You want to be able to say like, okay, I got like four button clicks, that's great, but like that was over six weeks. So like then if it's a six month goal, then at six weeks you probably want to say like, all right, I need to figure out what I need to do. Do I need to change the text of these buttons? Um, do I need to make the buttons bigger? Do I need to make them stand out more? Um, anything like that. Um, so set smart goals. And you want to know your audience. Um, part one of that is what are they coming for? Like if you don't know why anyone's going to your website, um, why do you have a website? Like, um, you know, if it's really just because you felt like you needed to have a website, then um, I mean, I guess, yeah, if you really want to make a website just to make a website, um, then this talk probably isn't relevant. But mostly you want to think like your target customer. What information will they want? And will they find it? So like if you're selling um, posters, you're, people are going to want to know specific information. Like they're going to want to know how big are the posters, what are they printed on, how do you ship them? So think about your customer and think about, think about it like you are a customer and figure out like, what would I want to know if I went to this website? What information would I want to know on, my sa on a sales page so that I feel like I have everything I need to know to make a decision? And then part two, what are they finding? Heat maps, um, so like Hotjar, um, those are great tools where they literally show you where people go on your website. Um, just a fair warning, they will slow down your website load a little bit, so don't like leave heat maps on all the time. But when you're in the middle of like a campaign, turn them on every once in a while. You actually can write scripts to randomize it too, so that it's only like every tenth person um, is uh, done with heat jar. Um, and you can just build that right into your cookie consent thing that you're just telling people because you're not collecting their personally identifiable information except if they fill out your form and it goes to your stuff, in which case they provided that no matter what. Um, but yeah, the heat maps are not tracking everything they do on their computer. It's just like where they go, what they scroll to, and generally like what stuff are they doing. It'll show you, did they highlight something? Did they click on something? Did they just kind of hover their mouse around something? Um, Cause that's one of those funny things. What was that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can see like how long they were there, um, including which section they hung out on. Um, and one of the funny things that people will do um, that you probably do and don't even know it is when you're reading a web page, it's quite likely not so much on phones. Phones have kind of messed this up, but when people have mice, they actually tend to kind of like hover the cursor around what they're interested in. It's really funny to watch, like when you look at heat maps, and you'll literally see that like people's cursors just kind of like went back and forth over something that was interesting on your page. Sometimes it's a picture too. Like if it really gets people's attention, you'll just see like that sitting around there. Um, but yeah, that's a great way to know. Um, but you want to know like what are they finding? Like what are they coming for versus what are they finding? And in this case, that's where heat maps help, but also just in general looking at it from that perspective. Like, say, like, if I was a customer, I'd want to know this information. And then go to your page and say, like, do I have that information? Um, and that's where, like, you know, the title of this comes in. Like, your sales page sucks because, let's be honest, we all probably, like, if we look at our sales pages and think about it from an outside perspective, there's probably at least one thing that we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I really, I should have put that there because people want to know. Um, and then number four, you want to focus on your content. Um, start with the essentials. Um, so what are the main things that people need to know? Start with that and only that. I'm not saying that needs to be your entire website. Like, I'm not saying like just put a list of what people need to know and do nothing else. But start with that. Um, 
focus on the absolute essentials people need to know because you know in that example of selling posters if I went to one and it showed me what posters there were what it was printed on the size and how it gets shipped in the pricing and they had nothing else I still probably buy it because like that gives me everything I want to know about whether I'm gonna get this poster or not um, and you don't want to make them work for it um, the goal is to get them to take action so don't make it hard for them to find what to do um, so you want to be focused in that like you don't want to like fill it with all this information and then make them like hunt around because if they're on your sales pages if they're on your product pages or anything like that like most likely they're looking for a way to sign to buy it uh, to sign up for whatever you have buy your product anything like that so don't make them work for it focus it so that like their attention goes to just that key information then you can later like add in some stuff you know once you're sure that you've given them front and center all the key information then add some fun stuff and again have a clear CTA so I put this one in here on purpose like multiple times because call to action like get some kind of action make it clear what they should do um, don't have too many call to actions like if you have like 10 CTAs if you're like I'm gonna collect their email and I want them to sign up but also I want them to do a raffle also I want them to, like if you have so many things that they're like I don't know where to click then like there's a decent chance they're gonna be clicking on the wrong things because if you have checkout on your site that's probably really where you want them to go so don't have like pop-ups that take them somewhere else for something else when like that might distract them from ever checking out and I've actually I've seen that plenty of times where like on a checkout like you can be on a checkout page and they have something that like does a full screen overlay that's like would you like to sign up for our newsletter and then you have to like click a button it's crazy like um, or like they'll be like rate us on the App Store while you're trying to buy and I'm like well yeah I'm gonna give you like zero stars because you wouldn't even let me sign up um, and make it easy to take the action you want them to take um, don't make them fill out super long forms to check out um, eventually you'll need to collect some information but try and make it as easy as possible if there's information you can collect after they take action um, try and do it that way get that get that action done and then do the rest after um, get the absolute essentials um, and yeah keep it simple or they might just quit number six is test your site um, this may seem very basic um, but make sure your site works um, it's not gonna sell anything if it doesn't even work I see that all the time um, I've seen that from yeah so many WordPress companies uh, because we partner with a lot of companies and like there are some times when their website is just like straight like down or other times it's broken and like that can happen to any of us because servers crash and we have no control over it um, but like when it's down like some of them have been down for like a week or two and it's because like people on their team just didn't go and look at their own website um, so monitor uptime using keywords don't just monitor for status because like white screen of death is one of the most common things that happen in WordPress and that won't typically register as the site is down they fixed that a decent amount with like WordPress can do like a try catch that um, you know will tell you like there was a fatal error but there's still a lot of things that can happen that can make your content disappear so it like monitoring will say your website is up but uh, yeah most important thing is just look at it yourself like if you have if you're selling anything if you're making money from your website um, then I can tell you right now you absolutely have time to check your website every day even if you feel like I have a million things to do if you really can't spare three minutes to make sure your website is up then like you need to change how you do business because like you always need to have time to just check that your stuff is working because if your website is down for two weeks I don't know how many sales you know might be lost on that but depending on if you have a hundred sales a day typically and your website is down for a week because you just weren't paying attention because you were doing other business stuff you know that's potentially 700 sales that you've lost in a week um, and then you want to test the CTAs so if they're forms like things like sign up for a newsletter if they're contact forms if it's a checkout if it's even just buttons make sure the buttons work um, so many sites have like you click the button and nothing happens or you click the button and it goes to a 404 um, you absolutely want to be testing these obviously I, I don't expect everybody to go through their entire site every day um, but I recommend weekly 
um, just go through and just make sure. Again, that's 10 minutes a week. Just go through and just click like, okay, can I fill out this form? Okay, does checkout actually work or does it throw an error as soon as you add the product to the cart? Um, do these buttons go anywhere? Do these links go anywhere? Um, but also ask other people to test for you, but don't give them too many instructions because if you give them a whole bunch of instructions, you say test exactly like this, then they're much less likely to be able to actually test for issues. Um, there's a great um, joke about uh, QA engineers, quality assurance engineers, um, and it's a uh, QA tester walks into a bar and orders a beer. QA tester walks into a bar and orders negative one beers. A QA tester walks into a bar and orders potato. Uh, QA tester walks in to a bar and orders cat. Like, so like it just, you just get crazier and crazier because that's what QA testers do. They think, um, there's a great website called your, your, client, your customer is drunk, I think is what it's called, and that somebody who actually he gets just drunk and then screen, like, does a screen recording of, you, of him going through it. But you need to think like that. Like, you need to assume that people are, like, if there's a form where it says, like, put in your credit card number, you need to assume that they are going to put in their best friend's last name because people do the craziest things. So you want to, like, make sure that, like, you also are testing, like, will this catch that this is not the correct information and will it throw an error or will it completely make the entire checkout break? Um, so don't give them too many instructions. Let them do stupid things. Let them click the button 100 times because the first 99, it might work fine, and then on 100, your website crashes. These are all things you want to know. And get the outside input. Um, ask non-experts. Um, similar to the your, your customer is drunk, um, ask non-experts like friends, family, or even strangers. Um, you know, like if you're hanging out at a bar and um, somebody, you know, orders, just says like, give me potato. Um, that's the person you want to be like, hey, can you check out my website and tell me if you think that this checkout works properly? Because they're the one who's going to like just start doing crazy stuff. Um, don't give them any info before. Again, you don't want to instruct it to the point that they'll do exactly what you would have done because at that point, like, they're not going to give you important information. And take it personal. Don't discount feedback as invalid because they just didn't understand. A lot of people like to ask people like, oh, what do you think of my site? And then when people are like, oh, this is confusing, this is confusing, this is confusing, they say, well, that person, they're not a WordPress person, they don't understand. But the truth is, like, your customers are quite likely non-technical. Um, and if the person you asked didn't understand, then your audience might not understand either. So you want to make sure that you take that feedback and, and run with it. And my final thoughts, key points. Uh, Make the time. If you're selling anything, your sales pace just serves attention. Um, everyone can afford a couple minutes a day. Like if you're running a business, you can afford a couple minutes a day to just make sure that your website is working. You can afford an hour a month to go through it all. Um, you can afford the time that it takes and, and even a little bit of budget. Um, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot to, um, you know, to pay somebody, you know, 50 bucks to. Um, to just make sure your website actually works. Like if they're good at, at testing, just have them do it. Um, and keep it simple. Um, always have a goal. Make it easy to achieve that goal. Um, don't overcomplicate things because you're much less likely to be able to do what you really want to do. And stay sharp. Keep updating your sales pages based on feedback and metrics. Uh, don't expect the audience to get better at figuring it out. They can guarantee you it will always get worse. Um, so if you think to yourself like, oh, these first couple months were rough, but it's just because people haven't figured it out yet, but sales will get better in the next few months, that's probably not going to happen. So just keep updating. Like, Watch those metrics. Watch what Google Analytics says people clicked on or didn't click on. Um, when people message you and say, I can't check out on your website, go and figure out, like, even if it was an error on their part, figure out why did they make that error? What confused them? And measure everything. Don't leave it to gut feelings and assumptions. No matter how good you think your gut is, I can tell you that it sucks. And it's going to tell you that things are wrong um, when they're right, and it's going to tell you that things are right when they're wrong. Um, so find a way to measure your goals and your pages. Thanks for listening. Go Bills. Go Bills. <laughs> also, at the WP Buffs booth, we have a ton of candy, um, and it all needs to be eaten today. 
Um, it cannot go home with me. Um, you can also get a discount code for WP Buff Services. We have some cards there. And um, today at 2.20, we are giving away an iPad and AirPods. So you can sign up at the booth and then, uh, yeah, possibly win one of those. Cool. I have like three minutes for questions. Yes? It could be. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so the question was, um, can sales be synonymous with the homepage? And absolutely it can be. Um, that's actually a great way to do it. If you think of your homepage as a sales page, that's cutting out a lot of excess. Um, so yeah, your homepage can be a sales page if, if the goal of it is to get people to sign up, which generally it is. So I do think of homepages often as part of the sales page, at least the funnel. Um, and it's to, you want to get people off of that so home page, probably to signing up. Even better if you have like literally a way to check out right on your home page. I highly recommend it. Some people think you need to get them to go somewhere else, but like if if you're selling something and you think someone can just like sign out uh, or check out right on your home page, do it. Um, get them from yeah point A to point B as quickly as possible. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was um, just about how you get heat maps. Um, so I use Hotjar, um, that's the product. And uh, so they, they just give you like a little snippet of code that you just throw right in the header. There are plugins that can do that as well. And actually Hotjar has a plugin. Um, so you can do that, you just sign up on hotjar.com. Um, there are other ones, um, I don't know off the top of my head the names, but I know that there are others that I've seen. Um, but yeah, you can just, do that, install a plugin, um, and either put the snippet or use what I, I believe Hotjar still has a plugin. And then, yeah, it'll just track that all. But the, the information will all be on hotjar.com. It's, it's a separate service that runs outside of WordPress. Any other questions? All right. Oh, yeah, Trevor. So going back to the idea of the posters, so if I have a, a, pay, or a site that sells lots of different posters, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would absolutely think of those as sales pages. Um, so yeah, like anything, oh yeah. Um, so the question was whether, like using the poster example, um, do you think of each product page as a sales page? And absolutely, yeah, like um, you can have 10 sales pages. Um, and generally with that, like your goal is either, like if you sell multiple products, maybe you, your goal is to get them to click the add to cart. And then like the funnel is get them to go to cart and then check out. Uh, but absolutely, yeah, those, those principles would apply to every single one of those product pages. All right, and I think that's all the time I had. Thanks, everyone.